Good afternoon. Happy Friday, Miami sports fans. Welcome back to the Miami Sports Break. Dave Eversole here, joined as always by Jakari Givens. And we got a special guest right here in the middle shot, Jazz Santana of the Five Reasons Network, Five Rings Canes. What's going on, gentlemen? What's up? What's up? Good Friday, man. You know, we out Good here. Friday. It's fine. That's it. That's it. But uh, before we get started, I want to mention one of our great sponsors here at the Five Reasons Network, Biscayne Bay Brewing. I know it's a Friday afternoon, getting close to time to crack on a cold one. So uh, make sure you reach out to our wonderful sponsor, Biscayne Bay Brewing, big supporter of Miami sports uh, in the local scene. And uh, a huge uh, thank you to them for being part of our network. You can find them below BiscayneBayBrewing.com forward slash beer finder to find them in your location. So want to start today with Canes baseball a little bit, Jazz. I know the season kicks off tonight with uh, three games set at UF. Obviously, UF is a top team in the country. So what do you uh, expect from the Canes to kick off the, the weekend at uh, Gainesville? Yeah, so we uh, so we typically don't start off with them. They usually we usually play them the second week of the uh, of the season. Uh, we usually start off with a team like uh, uh, Rutgers or something like that, which which helps some of the young guys uh, kind of get in and get their feet wet a little bit before they start playing. You know, uh, big boy baseball. Uh, University of Florida is the number one team in the country across the board on on most publications, if not all of them. So uh, I think it gives them an opportunity to come in. Listen, I mean, the Canes are not too shabby themselves, ranked number six in the country. Uh, some have them a little bit, you know, uh, lower than that. But we'll go with the number six ranking because it's the nicest one to uh, to say. But uh, uh, eight, eight of their nine guys in the lineup come back this year. Uh, the only missing piece is Freddie Zamora, who, uh, who's obviously playing professional baseball. But uh, probably th- – the best, if not one of the best lineups in college baseball with uh, returning guys uh, like uh, uh, Golden Spikes um, nominees, uh, Alex Toral at first base, Adrian Del Castillo, who's probably the best hitter in baseball right now, one of the best players out there. Uh, so it's going to be exciting to see this lineup hit. Uh, and I'm also excited to see Yoan Di Morales, who's one of the top players uh, in the in the country as well as a freshman. Uh, coming in to probably play the shortstop position. He's a, he's another local kid out of Braddock Senior High School in Miami. So the biggest question mark is obviously going to be the pitching staff, losing all three guys from last year's uh, rotation. Uh, plugging in Daniel Fetterman, who was our closer the last couple of years. Didn't really like him in that role as much as I thought I would. Uh, hard-throwing righty. Uh, but he does do better in longer innings, you know, as he as he progresses. He's the type of guy that can come in in the seventh, eighth, or not uh, seventh inning, sixth inning, and kind of he takes some time to kind of get better, right? So I think this this role as him being the starter, he is uh, scheduled to be the Friday Friday night starter. Today's game was at three p.m., but it got moved back to five due to inclement weather up in Gainesville. So we'll be uh, uh, we'll be watching Daniel Fetterman uh, get his first start as a Friday Friday night starter for the Hurricanes. Uh, then you've got some other guys on on uh, Saturday and the Sunday. Guys are two freshmen that are in the top 100 as well, coming out of high school. Victor Maderos, another hard throwing righty, and Alexander Rosario as well uh, to round that out. But you're going to see a lot of guys. You're going to see a lot of a lot of guys pitch because of how young they are um, at that position, uh, also, especially. Uh- also with the COVID stuff, so you never know at that either. So, oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you, you saw last year some guys like Jake Garland and Carson Palmquist, who is probably our top left hand uh, left handed pitcher out of the bullpen, is a kid like Palmquist who may get some opportunities to start mid- midweek games or or even end up being on the weekend rotation. So you're going to see a lot of different kids uh, come in and throw. Uh, you've got a couple of two way players, and um, one being a grad transfer. Uh, by the way, the grad the, the transfer portal doesn't only do wonders for Kings football. Uh, Kings baseball got a good one out of USC. Uh, ben Wagner, uh, I'm sorry, not Wagner, Wanger. Uh, ben Wanger, um, who is a uh, another another guy who throws kind of hard. He's going to be the closer this year. It looks like he's going to be set up to be the closer. Um, and you may see him a little bit in the outfield or at first base, swing the stick a little bit also. So a lot of a, a lot of good news coming out of. Um, Kings baseball camp, but the biggest question mark is always going to be right now the pitching staff because they're so young. They lost so many guys, but uh, the lineup, uh, you know, top in the country. So I'm, I'm not concerned about that. I think we're going to see a lot of runs being scored. It's a different season too, obviously. It's more of an ACC heavy season, I believe. It's uh, 50 games overall and 36 of those are going to be conference matchups, correct? 
Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. You're going to see a lot more ACC play just, just the nature of, of everything that's going on, like Jock mentioned the COVID thing and, yeah. and uh, right? they, they typically tend to stay home a lot anyway. So any of their out of conference games are usually against teams like uh, Florida Gulf coast, FIU, uh, the Gators. Yeah, they don't really. I haven't really seen. They don't really play. go out of state. Yeah, I yeah really unless seen it's them a, play a top matchup in a while. Unless it's a conference game, you know, if it's a conference game, they'll go to like Louisville and uh, who is Virginia? Uh, who's yeah, Virginia, Virginia Tech. I have it, like those guys. I haven't followed Kane's baseball in a while. I mean, I always know Kane's are really pretty, uh, pretty, pretty good in baseball. Um, I just remember as a kid going to the games over there at the stadium with my uncle. So. Um, it's fine, I haven't fallen. I haven't fallen them in a while. Um, I know they always have a top group out there. Normally, they always have good hitters. Not from what I remember, uh, Grandall, just to name a few people. But I remember the top hitters they had. So it's pretty exciting for Canes baseball. They always pretty good. I think they can probably knock off UF in the early series. Um, just to see where they at. It's a good stepping stone for them just to test the waters and you know get the feet wet and see where you at with the lineups. Yeah. I, I, Look, I don't think it's going to be – I don't think we can really gauge how good or bad this uh, hurricane program is going to be after this series. I mean, it is against the number one team in the country, bro, and and vice versa, right? I don't think you can really gauge how good or or how poor uh, Florida may be. I mean, they're the top team in the country also. So, But it is the first series, so you're still working out some kinks. You're still going to have a rotation that you may not see you know, pitchers stay in longer than four or five innings depending on how – um, you know how how they're how they're pitching, but uh, and, and you're going to see a lot of kids come in and get some get some at bats also. So uh, it all depends. But then again, it is a rivalry. It's Miami, Florida. Uh, Miami has not done well in the rivalry recently. In the last ten games, they're uh, two and eight, or I guess you can say the Gators are eight and two uh, against Miami in the past ten games. And in the last twenty games, there's it's, I think the the numbers are even worse right now. So I think this is a good opportunity, like Jock said, for for the Kings to. Uh, you know, get a couple games and maybe win the series. So, Jazz, uh, transitioning over, how did you feel about the loss of T. Will, who obviously took the job at uh, UCF? Um, what are your thoughts on that? I know he was only with Miami for 16 days, but um, how did you feel about that jump? I think this was, uh, yeah, I mean, I think this was less of a surprise than something like what happened with uh, Chris Ball back in the day. Uh you know, Gus Balzan is, is a guy who T. Will was on his staff. Um, and so did I, I, it's not like I didn't expect it. It's not, I'm not saying I expected it to happen, but I knew it was, a, it was a possibility. And this is why Miami can't have nice things, man. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, you know, it, it, it is what it is. I'm disappointed to see him go because I, I was excited to see what he could do here, uh, you know, developing linebackers, but also recruiting some top guys. But it looks like some of the guys – are still on board with the program, still uh, being recruited. So uh, we'll see who comes in now. I know there's a lot of names out there that you know people are excited about, like Jamar Chaney and uh, Christian Robinson and some of those guys. So we'll we'll see who who the next guy is. Uh, but like like Paul said on last night's show, follow the follows. That's who you got to. Uh, that's who you got to follow. You got to see who Manny Diaz is following. Apparently that that works out with a lot of times when when they hire new. Positions. I just. Um... I agree with you on that. I think Manny, you know, he I, one thing I will give him credit for, even though I still think he's gonna get fired at the end of the season. Um, <laughs> the one thing I do give him credit for is that he does try to go and get the right guys to mix and match his style. Uh, you know, T Will is destined to go just like last year, he's gonna be destined to go after this season if they have another good season. Uh um coaching. So I mean it's a coaching world, those guys have to go to where they're obviously going to get paid more money. It's, it's a coaching profession. And I, I think T. Will's jump is more so because he wants to be a head coach. It's not because of anything that Miami did. I just think he wants to be a, a head coach. Um, and we'll see where it goes. But I do think Miami has done a good job with some of the staff. Um, but like I said, I, I don't. the only thing I don't disagree with is the defensive coordinator role. Um, we discussed that in full on the show. And I just think we need to just tone the expectations down with Manny and let him get his feet wet there. But I, I, in all honesty, I think uh, Robertson and uh, Shoot are going to probably be calling the defense. Like, Manny would be calling the game, like, by, like calling the game. But I think those guys would be giving him 
the game plan plays. Hey, look, yeah. let's just go as this. Yeah, that's why I really like that ship hiring. Yeah, he's going to be the D.C. next year, though. The only reason he couldn't this year because of the money issue at Michigan. Uh, if he took an actual coaching job, uh, they couldn't. They weren't going to pay him the rest of his money, so that's why he took the analyst role next season. He'll probably be ready to be D.C. Do you feel like the roles are really clearly defined on the coaching staff on defense? You think there's kind of a defensive staff by committee? How, how do you think it's all going to play out, though, with Manny kind of being uh, at the head of all that? Do you think there's going to be communication breakdowns? Do you think it's going to be smooth? I mean, so, it's, it's kind of unprecedented all these different people in, in sort of ambiguous roles, if you will. Well, if you look at it, um, you got to look. Like, Kirby Smart is the same way. Kirby Smart, that's his defense. He's game planning with them. He's just not calling the games on Saturday, but that's everything he rolling with. He's very in, in tune with it. So it's not nothing that's not normal of defensive coaches to be heavily involved in the game plan. The only difference is he's actually calling the game, which, like I said, can interfere with your head coaching responsibilities because it does. No matter what you try to tell me, it interferes. What are you going to – when you're supposed to be worried about the memorial, morale of your team, you're on there calling plays on defense, trying to adjust, make adjustments on the sideline. So your attention is less there than it is – focus on being the head coach you the ceo so all the wins and losses are on you anyway so now you adding the burden if your defense give up 600 yards now you got to answer questions on why the defense was so bad and why your team was bad and i think everybody's role is defined like i said i think it's going to be a defensive court defensive coordinator by committee you don't hire two high level guys like that and bringing them in to just be, you know, regular guys. You got two quality guys who can probably be DCs at a lot of other teams in the country. And I think those guys are gonna be heavily involved in. I, I really feel like they're gonna take over the play calling at the end of the season. He I mean he brings up a I, I you bring up a good point, Jock, on on Shoop uh being the DC next year. Uh, I could definitely see that, especially if if it if it goes well for Manny, yeah, I, I definitely see Shoop coming in and being the defensive coordinator because I think now You've got Shoop in there one year, you know, uh, kind of acclimated to everything. And, and 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 going back to what you said originally, Dave, I think I think these things happen more often than we realize as far as uh, defense by committee per se. Uh, and and listen, you've got Traveris Robinson there who has called the defense before. Uh, you've got uh, defensive line coach and Jess Simpson, who's an NFL guy uh, who can come in, and I think he will. I don't know how it's going to work because I, I don't pretend to know how, how the whole ins and outs work, but I think he might take a little pressure off of the whole uh, what head, you, coaching, what, head coaching. What you, mean, what you mean the ins and outs of the coaching staff? I kind of add on to. Yeah, that's why that's why you would know, right? But I I feel like maybe Jess Simpson being having that role as co, uh, you know, assistant head coach or whatever might be able to take some pressure off of Manny in that aspect. So when the guys are the assistant head coach, they're just the next quarterback in line, basically. So – they right. help the coach make decisions. Uh, it's just intrigue on game plan. So the reason why Jess Simpson is Manny's assistant head coach because that's going to be his right-hand man. That's the guy he's going to go to. Hey, what do you think about this? Similar when Kirby Smart was at Alabama. He was the defensive coordinator slash assistant head coach because him and Nick Saban worked closely together. And then most times it's the coordinators who are assistant head coach. But it's, and sometimes it's the position guys as well. <laughs> and, and, and really quick, Dave, before you get to the next thing, I think it's important to understand because I know a lot of fans are going to ask why Gus Malzahn didn't go after Rhett Lashley, who was on the staff also, I know, as a GA. But I think the the simple and, you know, kind of flat answer to that is he's not going to go anywhere unless it's to be a head coach. So I, I just think Ooh, Gus, not Gus But Gus, Gus Malzahn not going after him anyway because he's calling his own offense. Right, and that's that's another reason, right? Like you're not going to bring him in, especially if you're calling your own offense. He's, you know, it, it just didn't make any sense. So I know a lot of people may ask that, and a lot of people may ask why Travis Williams wasn't the defensive coordinator here, why why he wasn't named the defensive coordinator here also. And, you know, Manny was very upfront about saying he was going to be the defensive coordinator and call the plays. And I just think that it was the right move for Travis Williams to make either way. I mean, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a bump the, up on, it, it the, not, on the pay scales and it's a promotion. I mean, you can't do that. And on top of that, they're going to go and win at UCF similar to Scott Frost doing 
he can go be a head coach at a lower level school, yeah, work his way absolutely. up. So, and plus, when you like Gus Malzahn is a a good guy. No, he's probably he's not easy to work for. Similar to Nick Saban because they like things their way. They they're not easy to work for. But people know if I coach under these guys, it, it, it's similar to Bill Belichick. If I coach under this guy, I'm gonna get opportunity. So it's just whatever I deal, whatever it is. It's a tough coaching, but I think like Manny Diaz hasn't hit that point in his career where people are like, "This guy's fucking hard yeah. to work with." Sorry for the language. He's hard to work with. But I know if I come to Miami in two years, I can go be a head coach. Everybody at Alabama, they go take analyst roles. Look at Bush Jones, there, former head coach at Tennessee. Took the job there, and then he he's now he's the head coach at another school. So you have to after. But Miami's slowly building back towards that. Miami has a lot to prove this season, and Manny Diaz has a lot to prove because, like I said, if he underachieves this season, it's that's it. I mean, I I feel like it's too much in place for him to succeed, and I think it's just he'll be going below expectations. I think it'd be time to move on. Similar, like I said, bringing in a Gus Malzahn who just got back into coaching. If he has a good season at UCF, transition to Miami, it's just a lot of good coaches to be out there. Yeah. The questions aren't just on defense either, obviously. You're going to have a lot of transition on the offensive side of the ball. The quarterback situation is still a little bit up in the air, obviously. And you're bringing a lot of new weapons, uh, running backs and wide receivers, losing Brevin Jordan. So there's going to be a lot of shakeup. And that wide receiver group really has to prove something this year. What think, do you think about – I think Rambo is going to be the guy, though, in my opinion. Dude. What do you, where are you at with that? You like Rambo? Rambo, huh? Interesting. Yeah, yeah that's a, you know, that, that's uh, not not a name you obviously hear you know right off the jump. But I think guys like maybe like Peyton are going to step up, and there's just going to be a, a lot of competition. I think these guys are going to have to get better. I don't think it's going to be like the past year where um, Wiggins and Pope were kind of just handed those uh, that playing time. I think it's going to be a, a lot harder competition this year. What do you think, Jazz, about yes. the wide receiver group? It's uh, it's Charlie Ramble, Mike Harley, and then and whoever else is going to step up because right now, you know, did Harley the guy from my did the guy from Montana come though? Right? If no, no, he no, he ended up uh, God, where was he? he? Ended up at another Power Five school. Okay. I can't, I don't, I don't, remember. I think West Virginia. I think he went to West Virginia or something like that. But um, uh, no, he he didn't end up coming. But um, you're also you're also looking at the tight. I think what we need to look at is a tight end position as well. Uh, with Brevin Jordan Lee going going out now to uh, uh, to the draft, I think it's a clear number one now with Will Mallory, uh, who's an absolute stud. And I, Jock has mentioned this. He feels like he might be a better, more pure tight end than maybe Brevin Jordan was, which I, I, I tend to agree with. I think you saw in, in the absence of Brevin Jordan how explosive Will Mallory could be, especially with some yards after the catch. But you also bring in a, a, a kid who's an absolute beast – out of Texas, who has Miami ties, Elijah Arroyo, uh, who I think is going to come in and, and and play right away. And maybe even Khalil Brantley is another kid out of Northwestern. Uh, and then you got some guys here that are already here, Larry Hodges and Dominic Mamorelli. Although I think these two kids that they brought in might be better than those two. Um, it's still going to be that, – that's a loaded – it's a loaded offense. Uh, it's a loaded tight end group, right? It's a loaded tight end group. So, uh, you know, you might see some of those guys spread out. Uh, and if the wide receivers can't get it done, maybe uh, no. Mallory spreads out wide. I don't know. I think that the receiver group is – as a talent is up there as well because um, you got to remember we, you're bringing in Romello Brinson, who I think is going to be a day one starter. Uh, Pope, Wiggins, the pressure is to them. So we're going to see where those guys respond and see the fight or flight for them. So if they respond how we think they can be and they get better, then you have an impressive group that even though I'm still think I think Wiggins should move to defense, but that's my opinion. I um, think you should. Yeah. Why not, man? We're we're I, thin I, there. I, I think he You can't catch, a, you play corner, right? Yeah, but I think he'll be a great corner. I like if I knew that kid personally, I'll give him just this speech. Either you wanna go undrafted or you wanna get drafted. Cause if he goes to corner. He has the measurables. He's what six two, like long arm guy. He's pro- I think he's one of the fastest kids on the team, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Top three, I think, or top he, four is, I think he is the fastest, or he was yeah. at one point. So yeah. you have nothing to lose there. But I think Miami's offense. The only position that I'm in question about is not the skill guys or the old line. It's the quarterback position. Uh, just because if Jake Garcia has a strong camp, you kind of got to start him over the Eric King. 
Well, if De'Ari King is not healthy, I think. He's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if he's even... Healthy, healthy or not, I think Jake Garcia has a better cap. If it's close, you start the young kid because he gives you more. I disagree. I think you still got to stick with De'Ari King. Uh, I just think his – I mean, he's still very talented. He's If they're both healthy, you know, comparing apples to apples, I think you're still going to give the nod to De'Ari King. I think he he's shown you that he can come in and he can play at that, you know, quote-unquote Heisman caliber level. Uh, for for this team, I think Jake Garcia. I think, I think Jake Garcia is just as talented. I think he will be. He's uh, a better passer right now. Yeah, he's, he's probably a better passer. He's. Pro- I, I would probably give that to you. But I think everything else that the Eric King does right now is better than what Jake Garcia can do uh, for this team, at least at the moment. Yeah, um, and that's use his legs, and that's you know extend plays. He's gonna have to because we all know. I mean, look, this offensive line is gonna be better, I think, because it's just one one added year of the guys coming back and Corey Gaynor coming back and, and all the other guys. Uh, but it's still gonna. There's still gonna be points where the, I think the offensive line is still gonna break down, and you're gonna need a guy like De'Ara King to make some plays with his legs. I'm not saying Jerry Jer Garcia can't do that because obviously, if you look at the tape. He can he can make some plays uh, outside the mm-hmm. pocket. Yeah, he, he can. Uh, but he does well on the run too, though. He, he, he does set and rip on the run. So, but I think so, if, if you want to win right now with the guys that are on the field, I think that you might need to just have a. a, a and I hate to use this word because an, anybody who's really good can be a leader, but a leader on the football field like Derek King. Well, I agree that, with that's you, not, guys. That, that's not true, though, Jazz. From us, from. From being in a locker room perspective, just because a player is good, don't mean he can be a le- leader. And I like De'Ara King that the quarterbacks being a leader because that's that's kind of like you you look at a guy like Josh Rosen, right? Josh Rosen was not a, a coach like a motivator or a leader of the men, like the leader of the locker room. He was a quarterback, and it hurts your team because the quarterback is the guy you depend on the most. Like you know, if your quarterback's a dog or a leader. You gonna follow his lead? Like I'm gonna play harder because I know this guy's out here with me and he's not right. scared. But do you and think he, King has a different style though? I mean, I think he's more of a maybe quiet guy because he showed toughness, he showed heart, he showed loyalty to the team, and I kind of agree with Jazz. I think he's earned that chance to run it back with a lot of these guys, and I don't feel the reason to put the pressure on Jake Garcia right away. Let him come in and kind of get acclimated to the Miami style and everything like that. And then if, if King has some ups and downs, and then maybe you revisit it then. But I think King, if he's healthy, you should at least give him the nod. He's coming back. He gave you a lot last year. He proved that he can be a winning quarterback. So, I, I mean, me personally, I'm not one for, like, carrying over from one season to another in such a literal sense in college football because there's so much change with these kids. But I think with the uniqueness of King's situation with the COVID and everything else – I think me personally, I, I would like to see him get a shot to at least start the season as a as a number one guy, and let uh, Jake Garcia and uh, TVD anybody else who's who's left uh, kind of fill that backup role in, in, until circumstances say otherwise. Right. People can keep people can keep mentioning Peyton Latoka too. I, I, maybe he, there there's something that they that they know that we don't know. I mean, I'm not saying he's a bad, bad quarterback because he's he's actually in that mold that Rhett Lashley likes. Uh, you know, he's a guy that gets out of the pocket and makes throws on the run a lot. I mean, he play. I mean, he's not your you know your big name out there. So I mean, I would say keep an eye out on Latoka if if the Eric King is not healthy. And that battle between him and TVD and Jake Garcia, that might be interesting to watch coming down the well, line. Well, Jake Garcia is going to get the nod over those guys in the beginning anyway just because he's, he's their top guy. Um, but I'm with you on that. It's, if it's a competition, you got to let everybody get a fair shape. Um, yep. I don't feel – I think Van Dyke's the least the, the least likely to play just because I don't – he's not agile enough for the system. He's more of a pure pocket passer, and I think he'll be a guy that end up transferring out later on down the line. Or he can wait his turn like Mac Jones did, but I think it, he's going to transfer out. But I'm in the grins, but I think another question mark for Miami is the D-line. Like, what, where are we going to get the production from that Phillips, Roche – Russo gave you over the last three seasons. Who's a guy that you guys feel like who can step up and be that guy? 
That's that's the biggest question mark. I think I think that that you know replacing those two guys is going to be tough. But I think that you have to right away you have to look at uh, the transfer out of Tennessee, the Andre Johnson on the edge. He's probably the most experienced guy. Might be the you know the best guy. Although you know that that that's arguable with with guys coming in like uh, well Jafari Harvey now, but he hasn't really shown as much yet as maybe we've wanted to. But again, look at who's been in front of him, right? Cam Williams, Chance Williams, some of those guys also. But I, I think a name to watch is uh, Jabari Ishmael, who's a kid coming out of Columbus that a lot of people are not talking about so much. But he's yeah, tall. I just, he's I just, I just I like see him. him at. Uh... Tropical Park when I was training my kids on uh, Monday, I seen him out there. I was just like, kid's pretty big. Um, I don't know. I haven't seen his tape, so I can't tell you if he's going to play right away, see how good his hands is, and see where he at. But, I mean, every, when you have guys coming in, there, it's in this uh, position with inexperience, everybody has a chance to contribute. So, Absolutely. It, it yeah, and we just, still have Harrison Hunt too. Obviously, I think yes. he's gonna take a big, big step. And you gotta like the interior of the defensive line, obviously with Nesta in there. But if you can get John Ford to maybe take a little bit of a no. step up as well, I think the Leonard Taylor, the, day one. That's Leonard yeah. Taylor. Yeah, yeah. Leonard Taylor, day one. Leonard I mean, Taylor. Yeah. Plus, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, he's obviously gonna be the guy. But I think you just you need that depth though. Yeah, in the in the middle of the defensive line, so you need to go four, five guys in the middle. I think at least to uh, just at least early in the season. And so that obviously, you know, those new guys really get their uh, feet underneath them. But, no, I'm excited for the Hurricanes, actually. I, I think they're going to – Zach McLeod, as- do you all think that transition of him uh, moving to DN works? I don't know, man. It's not athletic. What is he? What is he going to give you? I mean, is he going to set the edge maybe? As a run? I mean, what, what does he do out there? I, I just don't know what – He's going to bring. We got to give him a year. They do have a great D-line coach. So is this like year nine, year. though, right? Is this is year nine? He's <laughs> yeah, he, he's 42 years him, old. Him and, him and uh, Van Wilder, Patchen. Patchen's coming back again, right, for year yeah, 30. He is. Yeah, he's at Colorado State. He is coming back. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's <laughs> these guys. But, no, it was, uh, you know, very interesting, obviously, to, to see all the changes in the offseason with the Hurricanes coaching staff. And, uh, you know. and, and, and and you guys can finally be comfortable with the secondary with the Stevenson kid, who I think is. No, I can't. Um, I'm never comfortable with the Hurricanes secondary. No, nah, to Corey Couch is the best corner. Stevenson, uh, Al Blaze. Is coming back as well. I don't know if he's healthy now. I don't know what the situation was, what that situation he had late on in the season. I like um, Marcus Clark. I think he's going to be something. We'll see. Maybe yeah. at the nickel. Yeah, but yeah, they I, got they, some bodies. They, I mean, they need. They got they a lot of though. depth. They got a lot yeah. of depth at that position. I think Frierson probably. Um, I'm not Frierson. Keyshawn. Uh, Keyshawn Smith going. Keontre, I mean, Keontre, 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 Keontre yeah. Smith probably going to move to safety this upcoming season. But, I like it. I like him. But you still got Bubba Bolden. I don't know if Amari. I don't know if Amari Carter decided to come back yet because he was still deciding. But I think he should move the linebacker. Though, in my opinion, I think he should just transition now. He wants to hit somebody, so yeah. Yeah, that's I mean, for sure. Well, listen, guys, think, we're gonna less thinking. Exactly, yeah. just go downhill. But listen, we're gonna wrap it up here. Jazz, let everybody know where they can find you on social and everything we got going on within the network. Uh, at Jazz Santana is my Twitter handle, but also uh, at Six Rings Kings. Um, you can find us there. We obviously um, have the. Oh, uh, oh no, no, you're forgetting the biggest thing, Jazz. Oh, I'm the getting merger, there. the merger, oh, oh the, the merger, but no, the radio. I'm, yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there, man. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, obviously, our at, you know, our Six Rings Canes show on, on YouTube and and the merger with uh, Five Rings Canes podcast, so you can hear all the shows on the podcast. But you can also catch me. Every Sunday morning, whoever's awake at that time, uh, from seven to nine a.m. on Onside Radio, it's the the uh, the Sunday Sports Drop. Uh, for two hours there, we uh, we talk to different guys from all all South Florida sports. So uh, we'll have Brady Hawk on as usual every Sunday, and then uh, kind of rotate some guys uh, for Dolphins and Panthers and whatnot. Yeah, so it's, man, it's, it's, I, it's I still ain't got a call yet, man. So you know, kind of you might be my you might be my, my check- guy this Sunday, man. I'm about to check my text. <laughs> uh, John, yeah. give him the info too. You can nice. follow me at King Jock Twenty Four on every other social media. That's my social media. And also, guys, if you want, um, I'm doing great work in the community with the kids that I've been training. You can follow my uh, training page, Muscle Crew Inc. 
Uh, I give good tips on there as well. If you're an upcoming athlete, wherever you play at, any of y'all with kids and stuff, I put tips on there just to help you guys progress and how to become a Division One and a top-level athlete. So you guys can just follow that page as well. Uh, and also, we're going to bring Jazz. Jazz is going to be my, my baseball guy now. We need a couple of guys, man. Let me know, man. I got you. Good nobody, stuff. nobody better out there. <laughs> that, that's it. Well, we cover all the bases here. Uh, so appreciate Jazz joining us today. And uh, Jakari, always thanks, man. Have a great weekend, guys. And uh, we'll be back on Tuesday uh, afternoon with another show.